as well. And then also we have a really, really big event coming up next week, and that is our Harvest Festival. And so um, Harvest Festival, man, it's, it's our, our biggest event all year round. It's, it's one of our best outreaches. Um, that and Fourth of July are our biggest outreaches. I honestly think that the Harvest Festival might kind of beat out Fourth of July a little bit more just because it's an opportunity for thousands of people that are going to be coming through um, this building. So if you don't know what our Harvest Festival outreach is, Every year, Tooele does a downtown trick-or-treat on Halloween, and so this year it's going to be on Tuesday, is October 31st, and so uh, Tooele's downtown trick-or-treat is going to be from 3 to 6, and so what it is is all the businesses right here on downtown, they kind of set up a table out in front, and they place out candy, and so all the people are coming down, they're going to pass out candy. Uh, we go a little bit more overboard. We don't just put a table outside and give them candy, but we open up our entire building to them, right? And so... What it looks like is they're going to come through that, that back um, overflow room, which is our, also our junior high room. They're going to walk through there. Uh, last year's theme, it was a Bible land is what we call it. So last year's theme was um, Daniel in the lion's den. And so they go through Daniel in the lion's den. The year before that was Noah's Ark. And this year we're going to do Jonah and the whale. And so we're going to decorate it, make it look like you're inside the belly of, I shouldn't say the whale, it's, it's a big fish technically, right? But... Anyways, they're going to be walking through that room, and, and there's going to be Jonah there, and, and he's going to say a little thing to the kids as they go past, and then they're going to come through the sanctuary, and here we're going to flip this entire sanctuary around. We're going to take out all these chairs, and we're going to set up a bunch of carnival games. And so the kids are going to go around. We'll have a bunch of games for them to play, and they go around. They play. They get a bunch of candy, and then they'll exit out through our other back room, the, the ladies' room or the high school youth room. And then there is also a Bible scene, and it's going to be what we always do is uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so it's going to be kind of like this this uh, horseshoe, if you will. They're going to enter this way. They're going to come in here, play games, get candy. They're going to exit out. They're going to get two Bible land scenes. And so it's such an awesome outreach, especially because not only for the kids, right, we're going to be giving them a bunch of candy and sharing the love of Jesus to them, but also for the parents. You know, a lot of people who have never been in the building or don't know too much about us, they might even view us as a cult or something, I don't know what their, their view is, and then they come into the sanctuary like, oh, this is actually kind of cool, you know, maybe I should uh, check out this church, you know, and so it's an awesome outreach, and so with that, we need tons and tons and tons of candy. If you guys saw when you came in, there's a big bucket full of candy right by the, the entrance, um, and we need at least three, four times the amount that we have right now, so we always go through just an insane amount of candy every year. You know, we're, we're trusting in the Lord. He always provides. We've never run out of candy. There's always, every year, it's kind of like, you know, it's a three-hour event, and then on the last hour, we're like, oh, my gosh, we're almost out of candy. Like, okay, everybody just start passing out one candy to each kid. Okay, we need to be really careful here. And then about 30 minutes in, 45 minutes in, we're like, oh, my gosh, like, we feel like we have more candy than when we started on this last hour. And so then we have this big Home Depot bucket. We're just passing out to a two-year-old, you know, just like getting rid of all this candy. So... Not too worried about it, right? We know that God's going to provide. He'll multiply the candy if he needs to. Um, but that is not an excuse for us not to give if we can get some candy, okay? So um, either on Wednesday night service or next Sunday, if you guys would, just um, whenever you're shopping at Walmart or, or doing your grocery shopping, if you see a bag of candy, if you wouldn't mind just grabbing a bag, that would be super helpful. And then, too, if you can help out, um, Monday is going to be set up. And so it's a lot to set up because, you know, we can't really set up anything before that because we'll have um, church next Sunday. And so we'll try to break down all the chairs right after service next Sunday. But besides that, you know, it really just leaves us Monday to get everything set up and ready to go. So if you can help us set up on Monday and then if you can help us on the event, um, just kind of man one of the stations. There's going to be, like I said, maybe we'll have about 20 games in here or something. And then in the very back, we usually do a bounce house. So if you guys can just help out, be at a station, pass out candy, show the kids how to play the game. The more volunteers, the better. You know, I know it's exhausting. Some people, you know, you're, you're there at a game and for three hours. You're at a game where you're, you're picking up. You have to bend down and pick up this ball and give it back to them. You're bending down and you're doing this for three hours. And so what I would like to do is, is if we have enough volunteers, we can kind of get a schedule going so that way we can give people some breaks. So that way they're not just bending down, picking up a ball for three hours straight. So... Uh, the more volunteers, the better. And again, you can sign up for both of those um, in the foyer on that table. Okay, so other than that, um, that is it. We are ready for our study. 
I know Keaton prayed, but let's pray one more time, and then we will get into it. Father God, we just come before you, Lord. We're just so thankful for this morning, Jesus. Lord, that we can come here together as a church in unity, Lord, to hear from you, God. We, we're so grateful that we have this opportunity to go through the Bible chapter by chapter, verse by verse, Lord, understanding your word, Lord. We know it's so much more than just a book. But Lord, it is what you say in, in, in the Gospel of John. It is living water. Lord, it is life to our soul. It refreshes us. Lord, it fills us up. Lord, it is so important in our day-to-day -day lives, Lord. And so as we come here together as a, a body of believers, Lord, would you pour your Spirit out upon us, Lord? Would your Word break through the, the walls of our hearts and in our lives, Lord? If there's anyone in here who is struggling, Lord, who needs to hear from the word of life, Lord, who needs to be refreshed, who needs to hear about your goodness and your love in their life, Lord, whether they know you or not, God. Would you fill us all full of your Holy Spirit, God? Would this be a time where we can hear you, Lord Jesus? And so we are just so blessed to be here this morning. Would you bless our study? We ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, if you would, go ahead and open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. We're going to start a new study this morning. We went, to, uh, we went through Philippians when I got the opportunity to teach, and so we finished that. And so now on to 2 Corinthians. As you guys are turning to 2 Corinthians, a couple things to talk about about Corinthians is that uh, Paul had, wrote, had written this, this book to the church in Corinth. Uh, most likely Paul was in Macedonia, which is a northern province of Greece, and so he was writing this letter around 57 AD to this church in Corinth. And now Corinth was located in the southern province of Greece, and it was otherwise known as Achaia. Now, Corinth was this place that was um, not really known for, for good stuff. It wasn't very spiritual, right? When you thought of Corinth, you didn't think of spiritual things. You didn't think of churches. Um, it was a very dark and wicked place. It would be kind of like today we have Las Vegas, right? When you think of Las Vegas, you don't really think about churches. You don't think about Jesus. You don't think about anything spiritual. It has the nickname Sin City for a reason, right, when you think of, of, of Las Vegas. And so it's the same thing with Corinth is that there really wasn't anything good happening in Corinth. The people around uh, Corinth would, would kind of use it as a way of, you know, if, if someone were to call you a Corinthian, they would call you a Corinthian as an insult. So if I called you a Corinthian, I'd essentially be calling you like a no good person, right? Like that, that you're just a dirt bag and, and you have no worth and I don't care about you, right? And so they use the word, you're a Corinthian as an insult. If you went to the theater and there was a play going on and someone in the play was, was, had a character of a Corinthian, oftentimes they would be portrayed as a drunk or a gambler or someone who just wasn't a good person in that play. And so people around Corinth knew that this was a very dirty and dark place. And if you were a Corinthian, then you probably weren't a very noble person. You were probably a drunk or a gambler or a thief or, or something along those lines, right? But by the grace of God, we see that this, this church was planted in the midst of all this darkness, right? And Paul had a very special connection with this church. Now, with this church being planted, with it being this, this city set upon a hill to be a light to this darkness, there were issues that arose, right? That's why Paul writes 1 Corinthians. If you're aware with 1 Corinthians, if you've ever read it, we know that that's a pretty um, serious book, right? I mean, Paul just lets them have it in that book. And, and he's very stern with some of the things that is happening in the church. You know, he calls them out for it. Some of the things that are happening in the church, there was sexual immorality. Brothers were suing each other in the church. They were false teachers. They were people who were um, misusing the gifts of God, and the list goes on. And so as you go through 1 Corinthians, I mean, Paul really just kind of lays into the Corinthians in correcting them in their sins. And so when he writes 1 Corinthians, he sends this letter. Some of them maybe received it well, but others, they didn't really receive it well, right? They were, they were upset that Paul was, in a sense, rebuking them for their sins. And so typically what happens is if you're to be rebuked by someone because you're sinning and you're living this sinful lifestyle and you don't want to receive that rebuke, well, oftentimes what you'll do is you'll talk bad about the person who's, who's saying those things, right? You'll try to go after their reputation and you'll try to make them sound like they're, they're not really a reputable person. And so the things that they're saying, um, you cannot really take in an account, right? 
And so this is what people were doing. They started to, to lash out at Paul. They began to spread rumors and lies about Paul and, and say that, that Paul was not um, who he says he is. And Paul is unworthy to be able to tell us what we're doing right and tell us what we were doing wrong. And so they really got at, um, at Paul. And so this is where we see 2 Corinthians come into play. He writes this second letter to them. Um, a couple of reasons why he writes this letter. One, because he's trying to refute these false teachers. And two, he's also addressing those who didn't like his first letter, right? So he's now coming at them in a, in a different light, right? First and second Corinthians honestly couldn't be any more different because here in second Corinthians, we really see just a softness of Paul's heart where Paul is just coming and he's being open and honest out of all the letters we see in the New Testament of Paul. I mean, he just, he lays out his heart to them and he tells them, just, just his heart for them and encourages them and loves them. One of the main themes through 2 Corinthians he talks about is encouragement or comfort. And the reason why he writes this letter and he's encouraging them and comforting them, again, one, to, to show that, you know, the things that he wrote, he wasn't to, to just be mean, right? He wasn't just doing it to show them, well, well, I'm all holy and spiritual and you guys are sinful and, and just to lay in on them, but because he genuinely cared for them and he loved them right? Though they were messing up and they were in this, this city that was known for darkness, and yes, they had many issues, Paul really saw the potential of this church in, in Corinth. And so he cared for them and he loved them. And so in 1 Corinthians, the rebukes were out of love. They're out of sincerity because he wanted to see them prosper. He didn't want to see the, the Corinthians fall into the ways of the world around them but to continue to be a light in that dark city. And so, again, 2 Corinthians, we really just see the heart of Paul come out, say, hey, listen, I love you, right? The things that I said to you was meant to, to rebuke you, yes, but also to bring you into a place of forgiveness, to bring you into a place where you receive the grace of God and that you're not living like the rest of the world lives. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we will get into it. So Paul says, verse number 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Now, really quick, before we, we go any further, right, this is just the introduction that Paul gives. He says that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now, again, he's saying this because people were trying to discredit Paul by saying that he wasn't really an apostle, right? Um, understand is that, that Paul really was an apostle. Now, this idea of being an apostle... In a broad sense, um, apostles still live today in the sense that an, an apostle would be someone who is a representative of God. And so we, we can be an apostle being a representative of God in the, the broad sense, right? But in a narrow sense, and what we're talking about as an apostle here with Paul, is that he was an apostle that, that there was a requirement to be an apostle, and that is you had to see the risen Lord and Savior, right? And so for us today... There is no longer being an apostle in this way because none of us has seen the risen Lord and Savior. And so um, you have the 12 disciples minus Judas, so really 11 disciples who became apostles. And in Acts chapter 1, you see that the 11 disciples, um, again, who are now apostles, appoint Matthias to be that 12th apostle. Some people say that that was kind of a mistake on um, the, the apostles' part because they kind of just rushed into things and that Paul really should have been that 12th apostle. But either way, even though he wasn't technically appointed by the apostles, Paul even explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, I'm an apostle, not, not in the, the sense that everyone else was, because it was more of an, a, a unique way. The way I saw the Lord and Savior and Him risen was in Acts chapter 9 when he met the Lord on the road of Damascus, right? And so Paul did see our risen Lord. And so Paul is an apostle and he says he was appointed by the will of God. Now this is something to understand here is that how important it is to be appointed by the will of God and not be appointed by the will of man, right? The will of man and the appointing ship of the will of man means absolutely nothing if there is no appointment from the will of God. In fact, we even see Jesus kind of going through a very similar um, scenario. It's in Mark chapter 6, verse number 2. It says, And when the Sabbath had, go had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this it, which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? 
Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. See, even Jesus, he was teaching in the synagogue, and he was teaching where he would have grown up, and people would have known him from, from when he was just a child, and they would have known him just to be not the, the son of God, but just to be this carpenter. And then Jesus, he goes into the synagogue and begins to teach, and the people get offended at him. They're saying, who is this man? I mean, we, we grew up with this guy, right? He's just a carpenter, and now all of a sudden, he thinks he's worthy enough to go into the synagogue and to begin to teach all these things and, and do all these miracles. Who does he think he is? He, he didn't get the proper training, right? He didn't go to seminary. He wasn't a scribe. He didn't get to this point in his life where he could be worthy to go teach in the synagogue. And oftentimes that's how people view it. That's how they view Jesus. But of course we know that Jesus, he didn't need to be a scribe. He didn't need to go to a type of seminary. But that because he is God and he was appointed by God that he could teach in the synagogue, that he can perform these miracles before the people. And so much for us today is that to be appointed by God is, is so much better than man. You know, I think of my life and my ministry is sometimes people will ask me, you know, I'm not an ordained minister um, I don't have a degree or anything like that. And so I've had people come up to me a couple times and they'll say, well, well, how'd you know that you were a pastor or how'd you become a pastor, right? Did you go to seminary? I'm like, well, no, I, I didn't go to seminary. Well, you have a degree, right? No, I don't, I don't have a degree. I mean, I went to a place called Cavalry Bible Institute. It's a 10-month program and I kind of got trained up in the ways there, but, you know, that wasn't accredited or anything. I didn't get a degree out of that. I wasn't an ordained pastor when I was done with that. And then they'd be like, well, you want to be an ordained pastor, right? Well, maybe if, you know, if I have to do a wedding, you know, I, I got to do it for legal reasons. But other than that, I don't really care to be officially an ordained pastor. Okay, well, what about your degree? Surely you, if you're a pastor, you're going to want to go back and get your degree and do all this stuff. Well, maybe, you know, if, if that's how the Lord leads me. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to say that there's, there's anything wrong with seminary or getting a degree or anything like that. But if that's the reason you feel you are called to the ministry just to have a plaque up on your wall that you want to go and, and get your degree or you want to be an ordained pastor so you can put this certificate up on the wall and say, hey, look, I'm official. Listen, you're not official unless that is what the Lord has appointed for you in your life. And for all of us, you know, it's, it's not just that, that all of us are called to be a minister or a pastor. The question is, what are we called by the will of God? And you look at your life and your occupation, are you doing what the Lord has called you to do? Can you say that I'm Dave, the construction worker, by the will of God? Or can I say that I'm Steve, the mechanic, by the will of God? My Sarah, the nurse, by the will of God? And if you can say that, then, then that's what God has appointed you to be, whatever that occupation, whatever that, that thing is. That is the ministry that God has called you to be, if that is what the Lord has appointed you. And so this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, listen, Man did not appoint me to be an apostle. God himself has appointed me to be, to be an apostle. And so you guys want to try to discredit me, but take it up with the Lord because the Lord's the one that appointed me to be an apostle. Then he says in, in verse number two, to the church of God, which is in Corinth with all the saints that are in Achaia, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're familiar with any of Paul's letters in the New Testament, he always starts off his letter this way. He says, grace and peace to you. Sometimes a little bit differently worded, but nonetheless, every single letter you see of Paul, it says grace and peace. And it's easy to, to think that because it's in every letter that maybe it's not really genuine, right? Maybe he's not really sincere. It's just kind of a staple Paul puts there, and there's not really any meaning behind it, right? Personally, I believe every time Paul writes this, he genuinely means, means it, right? It's this greeting of grace and peace. The reason why he uses grace and peace is because grace was this Grecian greeting, right? If you were from Greece, you would greet people with grace. And if you were a Jew, you would greet people with peace, shalom, right? That's what you would say in, in Israel today if you were to greet someone, shalom. And so Paul is saying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, grace and peace to you. And he means it genuinely. And even here, right? I mean, I think even the more so in 2 Corinthians, Paul had every right to, to introduce himself in a completely different way here, right? He could have said, to the church of God, which is in Corinth, to all of you hard-headed, stubborn people who are backstabbers, who are treating me poorly, 
But no, he doesn't do that, right? He continues to, to greet them genuinely with grace and peace. But I really believe we see here that this is the Spirit of the Lord already speaking through Paul. It reminds me of uh, the relationship David and Saul had, actually, in, in 1 Samuel. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and 19, you'll find the story. Or if you're familiar with that story, Saul begins to become jealous of David. And, and he, he has this distressed spirit upon him, and he starts to get angry. What David does is he knows that this distressed spirit is upon Saul, and so he comes into the house and he begins to play music for Saul and continues to, to try to love him and, and soothe him. But Paul, uh, Saul is, is so hard in his heart and he's so angry and jealous that he decides to take a spear and he throws it right at David. And luckily David saw it and ducked out of the way, right? Now, David at that point had every reason and every right if he wanted to, to take that spear out of the wall and throw it right back at Saul. But that's not what he did, right? He, he, he fled the room. And he was crazy is it didn't just happen once, but it happened three times where David came in and he played songs for Saul. And, and three times Saul threw the spear out of him out of jealousy and of anger. But David, he didn't respond out of his flesh, but the Spirit of God was upon him to have this type of gentleness, to have this type of peace, to know that, yeah, Saul was, was churning his heart from the Lord. He was bitter man and, and he was having a dark heart. But, hey, that's the Lord's anointed and I'm not to touch the Lord's anointed. And he had that spirit upon him. And right here we see the same spirit upon Paul is that, listen, they had issues. There might have been some heartbreak by Paul by some of the things that they said. But we see here the inspiration of the Holy Spirit not to, to react in such a, a mean, harsh way, but to react out of gentleness, to react out of love. But again, that's not of Paul. That's of the Holy Spirit living inside of him. He says in verse number three, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which, which we ourselves are comforted by God. A lot of people ask the question, if God loves us so much, then why does he allow us to go through tribulations? Why does a loving God allow us to go through hardship? Why does he allow us to go through pain. Well, if you look in the Bible, we can see in many different areas that there, there are many different reasons why, right? There are many reasons that the Lord gives for allowing us to go through trials. And one of those reasons here in 2 Corinthians is so that way we, we may be comforted by God. See, this word here, tribulation, comes from the word tribulum. And a tribulum was something that was a threshing board. And so if you don't know what a threshing board was, it was this wooden board, and on the bottom part of it was these, these sharp pieces of, of bone or maybe some nails and, and sharp edged pieces that would kind of cut in like teeth, right? And they would have this threshing floor where they would lay down all the wheat and that they'd put this threshing board on top of it and all the nails and spikes and they would drag it across the wheat. And what that wheat would do is it would separate the wheat from the chaff. And so as this threshing board came across the wheat, this chaff would be carried away in the wind and you would be left with the good stuff, right? The wheat. And so this is what tribulation literally comes from, this tribulum, is that that is what it's like to go through tribulation sometimes. It's like taking this, this board, this tribulum across your face and just dragging it with all these nails and jagged edges as we go through trials. And, and it's, it's sharp, it hurts, it's painful. But in the midst of that, that pain, he's saying, God is there to comfort us that we can be comforted by God because we know that God is, is there with us and that he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. And we're going to be able to find victory through those trials, through the tribulum. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. If you're familiar with the story, King Nebuchadnezzar, he had a creed go out that all were to bow down to his statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to bow down to any god but Yahweh, right? But the Lord. And so they denied to bow down. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, King Nebuchadnezzar threw them in this fire. And it was a fire that was burning so hot, it said that the guards who threw them into the fire died because they got near this fire. So this scorching hot, as hot as they can get this fire, they throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into this fire. And if you know the story, Nebuchadnezzar is, is standing there at the fire and he's watching waiting for them to just disappear in this, this fire. But he sees that they're still there, and he, he asks his counselors, he says, how many men did we throw in that fire? 
His counselor said, well, we threw three men in. And he said, then how come I see four and the fourth is like the Son of God? See, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, man, they went through that fire, they were met with the Lord in the midst of that fire. And not only that, but they didn't get out right away, right? They stayed in there and they ministered with the Lord and they spent time with the Lord. They would rather be in the midst of the fire with the Lord than to come out of the fire without the Lord where it's cool and it's calm and it's gentle. But they would rather be in the midst of that fire because that is where the Lord was comforting them. That is where the Lord was ministering to them and that is where the Lord gave them all victory. And so not only that, but Paul needed to be ministered in these areas not just for his own comfort, not just for him to find his own victory, but that way he could minister to those who went through that same experience. Let's read it again. It says, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And so this idea is that when we go through trials, when we go through difficulties in our lives, when we experience pain, God comforts us, right? God gives us the victory. And now that past pain, that, that past experience we went through is now going to be used for our ministry, right? I heard a pastor say that our misery is also our ministry. So the things that we go through, the things that we struggle, when we see people that go through that similar experience, how much more empathy we have for that person, how much more our heart breaks for them, but how much more we can minister to them let them know, hey, I went through something very similar. But guess what? The Lord comforted me. The Lord gave me victory. And he can do the same through you. I think of my own life and my own personal experiences. And especially as a youth pastor, you know, I look back on my life and some of the things I went through. And, and at the time, they were painful. Uh, when I was in middle school, my parents split up. And it was a really painful time, especially because me and my dad, we don't even have a relationship to this day. And, and so as a middle schooler, you know, it was a really painful experience, man. I was just, I was hurting because I didn't understand, God, why, why don't I have a dad like the rest of, of my friends? And, and why can't I have a dad to, to teach me the basic things like to shave or to change a tire and do all these things? Like, even if my parents had to split up, why couldn't I at least have a relationship with him? And, and from that became a lot of depression in those early ages and Throughout high school, it kind of turned into bitterness, and I think I was a little bit um, upset and mad and bitter at God, and I didn't even really realize it. But as I went through this, this trial and this tribulation, and, and I was fighting it, right? I, I kept trying to just, just conceal the pain, conceal the bitterness. Well, eventually, later in my life, you know, I, I grew up in a church, and so I kind of knew the Lord, but I never really fully surrendered my life to the Lord until I was about a senior in high school, about to graduate high school. I finally surrendered my life to the Lord. And, and at that moment, you know, the Lord really began to minister to me. I really opened up my heart and, and it brought forgiveness and it brought gentleness into my heart to where I was no longer bitter at my dad. I wasn't bitter at the Lord, but I was able to have this forgiveness and I was able to have this love. And the Lord gave me true victory in that trial. The Lord gave me true healing through that trial. And so now as a youth pastor, man, how much more when I see a kid that goes through a similar thing? When I look at a, a middle school or a high school or someone around my age, when my parents split up, they're going through the same thing. I can minister to them so much easier because I know what pain they're experiencing. And it may not be the same exact situation. I, I can't say I felt exactly how they're feeling, but how much more empathy I can have for them, how much more encouragement I can, I can have because I was comforted by the Lord. And I was encouraged by the Lord, and I found victory in the Lord. And so I can bring that same encouragement into their lives. And so it's the same for us. Whatever that experience is in your life, looking back on, on your past experiences, looking back on your trials and tribulations, the things that the Lord has comforted you through, the things that the Lord has given you victory in, you can now use that in your ministry to comfort others who are going through that same situation. They're going through that same trial. And then he says in verse number 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are com comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. It says in Philippians chapter 3, verse number 10, 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. When I used to read this, this scripture, I never really fully understood what this meant, right? I mean, I can kind of get with the first two things. It says that I may know him, okay? And I know I want to know him, right? And I want to know the power of his resurrection, but to understand and fellowship of his sufferings, what does it mean to, to truly understand and, and have this relationship, to have this fellowship of his sufferings? Well, again, as it says here, it says, for as the sufferings of a Christ abound in us. And so again, our comfort in Christ is also to know that Christ went through sufferings here on earth as well. That as Christ suffered, whether it was on the cross, whether it was through temptation, whether it was through beatings, that those things that Christ suffered through, we can look to him for strength because he can relate to us as well, right? That's one of the amazing things with Jesus is that his ministry was, was much more than just to die on the cross, but also to relate with us in every way. Anything that we've ever dealt with, anything we've ever gone through, Jesus can say, hey, I was there too. I went through the same things, and we can find that fellowship and that suffering and find comfort through that thing. So it continues, it says in verse number seven, and our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake in the consolation. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Now really quick, if you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 9. What Paul is talking about here comes from Acts chapter 19, this experience that Paul had faced. And I'm just going to read it to you guys. And so if you want to read along again, Acts chapter 19, it's going to be starting in verse number 21. And so Acts 19, verse 21 says, When these things were accomplished, Paul purposed in the Spirit, when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, to go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. So he sent into Macedonia two of those who ministered to him, Timothy and Erastus, and he himself stayed in Asia for a time. And about that time, there arose a great commotion about the way. If you guys don't know what the way is, um, that is what it was formerly known before known as Christians, was they were known as the way. And so these Christians were made known. And in verse 24, For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. He called them together with the workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know that we have our prosperity by this trade. Moreover, you see and hear that not only at Ephesus, but throughout almost all of Asia, this Paul had persuaded and turned away many people, saying that there are not, they are not gods, or excuse me, they are not gods which are made with hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into di uh, disrepute, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana may be despised and her magnificence destroyed whom all of Asia and the world worship. Verse 28 says, Now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed, rushed into the theater with one accord, having seized Gaius and Aristoc Aristocris, Macedonius, Paul's travel companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples would not allow him. Then some of the officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent to him pleading that he would not venture into the theater. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and most of them did not know why they had come together. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense to his people. But when they found out that he was a Jew, all with one voice cried out about two hours, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And so we see this story in Acts chapter 19 that this riot in Ephesus had broken out because of this man, his name was Demetrius, a silversmith, who would make shrines to the goddess of Diana. This was a, a goddess that the Ephesians would worship. And he began to get nervous because 
He knew that Paul was preaching the gospel to all of Asia, and, and people began to give up Diana, give up all their gods to worship the one true God. And so out of his own greed, he said, well, we got to do something about this because I'm losing money, right? No one's buying my shrines that I'm making anymore. And so he, he gathers all these people of similar occupations to try to form up this riot to, to worship, uh, worship Diana of the Ephesians. Now, Paul was there, and there were some other disciples who were in trouble, people who were serving with, with Paul in the ministry. And he tries to go into this place, but he wasn't allowed to because they, they knew that if he went in, that would be it, right? He was going to die. And so what Paul is making reference here in uh, verse number 8 is, is this situation. And so we don't have all the details in Acts chapter 19, but apparently whatever happened at that point, he says that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we, we, did, uh, we, uh, we despaired even of life. And so Paul got to this point where he's like, oh my gosh, this is it, right? We're done. We're dead for. We're like, we're toast. They're going to destroy us. They're going to kill us all, right? And he says in verse number 9, Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. So Paul, he gets to this point where this is it, right? There's nothing he can do. He, he really got to this point in his life where he thought it was all over. And, and there's nothing in and of himself that could ever get him out of this situation. But because he got to that point, again, it says that he would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Paul had finally, at this point, he reached the end of himself. He'd gotten to this point in his life where he said, man, out of my power, out of, of my will, there's nothing more I can do. And so I'm just going to trust in the Lord, and whatever the Lord's will is, I'm going to trust in that and know that he is good. And the Lord spared them, right? The Lord showed up in that moment where Paul had finally reached the end of himself. See, oftentimes God brings us to this end of ourselves where there is nowhere else to go and, and we're just at a point where we're ready to give up. But when we get to that point, where we get to this point where we have nothing left in our, of ourselves, any more power, anything else that we can try to accomplish in ourselves and, and we get to this end, that's often the point where God really shows up in our lives. That's the point where, where God can really do something special where we have no other choice but to trust in the Lord. I think of the story of Jacob, if you're familiar with the Genesis and, and his life. Jacob, ever since most of his life, I mean, he was a, a rebellious dude. He, he always tried to get the upper hand in everything that he did. Ever since birth, even, when he was in the womb, he actually had a twin. His name was Esau, and they were both in the womb. And it said that Rebecca can feel them going at it in the womb. And God said, it's because there's two nations and, and they're going at it while you're in the womb. And, and from the very beginning, Jacob is, is wrestling with his brother. And the story goes that Esau is born first. And they call him Esau because he was a hairy baby. And, and Esau means hairy, quite literally. They saw he was a hairy baby and said, oh, he's hairy. We're calling him hairy. So they, they took names quite literally back in those days. And so his name was Esau. And as Esau comes out, Jacob grabs the heel of Esau as he's coming out. And they say, well, this one's a heel catcher, Yaakov, Jacob. That's what it means as a heel catcher. A little bit more loosely translated, dirty, sneaky thief. That's what the name Jacob means. And that's sort of his reputation his whole life is that he was a dirty, sneaky thief. He, he stole the birthright and the blessing of his older brother to the point where his brother was so furious he was going to kill him. And so Jacob had to flee home where he would meet his uh, father-in-law. And his father-in-law was kind of his match where he was also kind of a deceiving type of person. And they had this, this type of relationship where they're always trying to take advantage of each other and always trying to trick each other. And, and for, for all these years, 17 years, he was with Laban. And he finally got to this place where they were just so tense, this relationship of always trying to deceive one another, where he said, okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not really welcome here anymore, so I should probably just take all my stuff, I'll take my family, and I'm just going to get out of here, right? And, and there's no way I'm returning because he's probably ready to kill me too if, I, if he ever sees my face again. And so he leaves. And then when he leaves, he finds out that his brother Esau, after all these years, has hunted him down and is ready to kill him. And what does he do? 
he, he still tries to find ways to get out of it. He still tries to find ways, and, and he begins to come up with this plot. He plans out this way that he can try to, to soothe his brother into softening his heart that he wouldn't kill him, and, and he's doing all these things. Okay, let's come up with an escape plan, and, and, and it's this, this big thing. He's just focusing on how he can get out of this situation again like he has his entire life. And then it says the angel of the Lord came and wrestled with him all night long. This angel of the Lord was a little bit more unique than an angel, but it was the Lord himself. It was God in the flesh. We call this a Christophanes. Christophanes is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, this God in the flesh. And God himself had to wrestle with him all night long as he's, he's trying to get this plan ready for the morning before Esau comes up. But instead of getting a good night's rest and, and continuing his plans, he just wrestles with the Lord. And he doesn't let up, man. He just continues on and on and on until the sun rises. All night long he wrestles with the Lord until the Lord finally says, I've had enough. And he places his hand on, on Jacob's hip and it goes out of joint and he cripples Jacob. And finally there, as, as the Lord gets ready to walk away, he grabs onto the Lord and he says, I'm not letting you leave until you bless me. See, this this idea of Jacob asking for the blessing of the Lord was this idea when you'd ask for someone's blessing, you were finally admitting defeat. You were finally admitting that you were not superior, but that person that you're asking to bless was far more superior than you. The first time in Jacob's life, he finally comes to a place in his life where he says, I'm done. I'm defeated and I'm done fighting. And right there, the Lord said, your name will no longer be heel catcher Jacob, but your name will be Israel, governed by God. And from that very point, you know, Jacob going his entire life, now being crippled, he finally comes to this end of himself where he has to rely on the Lord. He has no other choice. But he finally had to get to the end of himself. See, before that point, he, he tried to fix his problems. He tried to deal with, with his situations in his own strength, in his own power. And so the Lord had to wrestle him all night long, had to fight with him his whole life until he finally got to this point where he said, Lord, I'm done. I'm not going to do this anymore in my own strength. I'm not going to do this in my own power. And that's where the Lord really showed up in his life. It's the same for each and every one of us in this room. Oftentimes we... We have to learn our lesson the hard way, unfortunately. Rather than just admitting defeat right away, rather than just admitting, Lord, I have nothing to offer. Lord, I, I cannot do this in and of my own strength. Lord, I cannot do this without you. And so I surrender to you. Rather, we feel proud. We feel like we are strong enough. And, and we, we go through life trying to fulfill this void inside of our hearts. We go through life trying to fix all of our issues. We go through life trying to do things ourselves because we're prideful, because we, we think that we're strong enough. And the Lord needs to bring us to this place in our lives because if he didn't, then we would just continue living on thinking we were strong enough, thinking we were powerful enough and that we can do it on our own without the Lord. It amazes me for people who, who don't know Jesus how they can really go on in life without ever having a relationship with the Lord. I, I can't imagine where my life would be at today if it wasn't for relying on the Lord to get me through some certain things in my life. There's no wonder why there's so many people who are depressed and anxious and, and have to rely on things like medication and counseling. And again, if, if that's you in here today, that's not me trying to say those things are wrong or sinful in your life. You know, I, I think that there might be an area in your life for that, but we should never rely on that. That should never be the thing that fixes us. That thing may be a band-aid. It might be something temporarily, but ultimately we need to trust in the Lord that he is ultimately our healer. He is the one that can give us victory through those things. But we must first come to this place in our lives where we have gone to the end of ourselves. We said, Lord, I'm done trying. I'm done giving an effort. I'm giving it to you, and I'm trusting with you in all of my situations, in all of my troubles, in all of my trials. Lord, I know that you are with me. Lord, would you comfort me through the trials? Because I'm done trying. I'm done doing it through my own effort. It continues in verse number 10. Not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, 
and does deliver us in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. So now he's saying he has delivered you. The things you've been through, he delivers you. The things you're going through, he's continuing to deliver you. And the things that you have not yet gone through, he will deliver you. And we can trust in that. We can trust that the things that we've gone through that he's delivered, those things are, are an assurance of our future victories. Our future victories are assured by our past victories. That, that God's faithfulness in the past can comfort us in knowing that because he has not failed us before, he will not fail us yet. He will not fail us now. He will not fail us in the future. That he is good and he will continue to comfort us. He says in verse 11, You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Now, again, with this, um, what Paul is saying here to the Corinthians is that not only in their own strength, but he's saying that their help together in prayer was a, a big part of this victory, right? This big part of, of, of victory and comfort was through their prayer and, and, and their lives. And so the importance of prayer Paul puts on uh, display here is that how much more we would be um, understanding of the power of prayer. I think oftentimes we take advantage of, of how powerful prayer is. We forget to pray, and, and we forget to pray for other people, and, and we don't recognize how powerful prayer could be. We don't recognize what that can do in our lives. Not that we're trying to change the will of the Lord, but that the Lord would change our hearts and our situations. That as we pray, again, we find comfort. Again, we, we find trust that we're not relying in of ourselves. We're not being prideful. But as we pray, the Lord begins to root those things out of our hearts, root those things out of our lives, and to pray for one another. I'm, I'm constantly convicted of this, that I don't pray enough for other people, that I don't take enough time out of my prayer life, not to just pray for my own needs, but to pray for, for other people. And, and just in prayer life in general, to pray even more. You know, I, I, I get convicted when I read what Jesus says with his disciples, if you looked at, at Matthew 26, when Jesus is in the garden and the disciples fell asleep, he said, could you not stay up with me for one hour and pray? And I think of that, I'm like, man, when was the last time I prayed for an hour straight? It's kind of hard to pray for an hour straight, right? But it's not hard to scroll through Instagram for an hour straight. It's not hard to binge watch a series for five hours straight. It's not hard to watch... 10 football games in a, a, a weekend, but it is hard for us to pray in an hour. And so, man, how much more effective we would be if we would just find a time to, to pray and be in the Word of God for, for a time. And I'm not saying it has to be an hour, but to make that a priority in our lives, prayer, time in the Word of God, it has to be something that is daily, consistently. We're in a race one day we're going to, to meet the Lord and Savior and we're going to complete that race, but we need to be prepared where we're at right now, continually growing in the Lord. And if we're not spending time with the Lord, then we're never going to grow. We're never going to be strengthened. We're never going to endure in this race of life. You think of an actual literal marathon. If I were to run a marathon next week, but I didn't train at any time up to this point, and I don't train any point until next week, am I really going to be prepared for that marathon? If I was serious about that marathon, I would spend every day keeping my body in shape, practicing, maybe going out for jogs and, and stretching or lifting weights and keeping my body healthy, eating right, making sure I'm prepared for that marathon. And that's what's likened unto our faith of the Lord is if the only time we're in the Word of God is Sundays for an hour, or maybe Wednesday nights for an hour, and that's the only time here at church that we're in the Word of God. That's great that we're here. I'm, I'm blessed that we're all here, and it's an important habit to be at church every week, but that's the only time you're spending with the Lord. You're not going to be prepared for this marathon ahead of us because the rest of the time, the rest of our week, we're just spent living in the world, allowing darkness to surround us without being filled with the Spirit of God daily. We'll close with this. If uh, the worship team would like to come up, we'll finish this last section. 
It says in verse number 12, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and more abundantly towards you. For we are not writing any other things to you than what you read or understand. Now I trust that you will understand even to the end, as also you have understood us in, the, in part, that we, uh, that we are your boast as you also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, understanding is, again, these people were kind of a real pain in the neck to Paul, right? And, and Paul really had to come at them with some love and sincerity. And he's explaining to them that, you know, he cared for them. He loved them. And he says that, that man, he's just filled with joy and, and, and honestly wanting to see them continue to grow. And like I said, these people, they, they expected so much out of Paul. And so any tiny little mistake Paul would make, they would find a way to accuse him of it, right? Like I said, we're not going to finish the rest of this chapter. We'll have to continue next time. But in verse 15, he talks about this idea that Paul, he told the Corinthians that he was going to come visit them. And some stuff happened in Paul's life, and he wasn't able to make the visit. And so some of these Corinthians who are mad at Paul use that as an excuse to say, well, Paul is fickle, and he doesn't really care about us. If he really cared about us, then, then he would have kept to his word, and he would have came and visited us. And Paul is saying, hey, look, anything I've said to you, anything I've taught you, it's all out of sincerity, right? These, these Corinthians, they expected way too much out of Paul. And, and oftentimes um, that happens even in today with, with ministry and with pastors. I think a lot of people, they expect way too much out of their pastors. And they are way too, um, they, they accuse their pastors too much if, if they're not doing enough, right? There was a study um, from this university in California, they did this survey to, to see what people expected their pastors to do, how many hours a week they expected a pastor to study. They expected their pastors to counsel and to do hospital calls and, and all these things. It was a survey to see how many hours a week a pastor should spend ministering. And at the end of the survey, it came out that people expected their pastor to take up to 135 hours a week ministering <clears throat> so if you do basic math how many hours are in a week after a pastor has been done ministering to everybody that leaves a pastor only four hours a day to spend time with his family to eat food to pick up their kids from school and and maybe if they're lucky after all those four hours they have about 30 minutes to sleep and then they'll wake up and do it again that's how much they expect pastors to minister. And that was kind of the same thing with, with these people. As man, they expected so much out of Paul. And if Paul couldn't fulfill it, then, then they would accuse him. And they would say these things. But Paul is, is defending himself, saying, listen, I'm here with all sincerity. I'm genuine. I, I want to be there for you guys. And, and anything I've ever said, I've genuinely meant it. In fact, the word there for sincerity he uses is a Latin word meaning without wax. Now, this word without wax is this idea that you would have these artists who would create these marble sculptures, right? So an artist, they would take marble and they would begin to sculpt out this, this person out of marble. And oftentimes what would happen is that this artist made a little mistake, right? They, they chipped a little too hard. And maybe they chipped off the nose of this, this sculpture that they were creating. Well, you can't really restore that marble that was fallen off, so how do you repair this nose? It would be ruined. And so what they would do is rather than trying to repair the mar marble, they would take this wax, and they were able to take this wax and mold it in a certain way, and they were able to color it in a certain way where they can put that wax onto the sculpture, and no one would, would know any difference, right? Because no one would be checking it and, and checking to make sure everything's all marble. And so you would be completely clueless until you brought it home and, and you put it in your yard and Maybe it was okay for a few months in the winter time, but as spring and summer seasons came along and the sun began to beat on this marble statue, the nose would melt right off, right? This is this idea that Paul gives of sincerity. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm without wax here, right? I'm, I'm genuine. I'm sincere because I see what good things the Lord is doing through you guys. I see what, what God can do for you guys in Corinth. 
and he's coming at them with this heart of, of genuineness. And so we'll close our service with that this morning. Let's stand. I want to give you guys all an opportunity in here this morning. Um, if there's anyone in here who has not accepted Jesus into their life, and it's the first time, and, and, and you're in a place in your life right now where you're at the end of yourself. You've never gotten to experience what it's like to have a pure relationship full of joy, full of peace with the Lord. And you're constantly trying to do things in your own power, and your own strength, and you're trying to find fulfillment in your own ways in the world. I would encourage you that today would be the day that you come to the end of yourself because if you come to the end of yourself today, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It's the beginning of God creating a good work inside of you. And so if you're in here today and you want to accept Jesus into your heart to be your Lord and Savior, I want to pray for you and I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Again, it's, it's not just about the words, right? You can say these words and you can leave here today and have absolutely nothing change but it must be a genuine, sincere surrender of the heart. That Lord, I am done fighting. I am done trying to be in control of my situation. Lord, I wanna surrender it all to you this morning. And I would encourage you afterwards too, we're gonna to have prayer. We're gonna have some leaders up in front to pray for you guys that not to just leave this room without getting encouragement, without getting prayer. If you don't have a Bible, we'd love to give you a gift you a Bible this morning. Because this is a room full of believers that if, if this is your first time accepting Jesus, that we're not going to judge you. We're going to encourage you. We're going to love you. We're going to come along to your side and minister to you and bring you that comfort. And so I would encourage you not to just leave, but to, to stay here for this last song and to get prayer and, and anything that you're going through that, that we would love to pray for you. And so I'm going to pray for you if you guys would repeat after me, Lord Jesus. I do believe that you are the Christ. I do believe that you died on the cross for my sins. I ask for forgiveness of all of my sins. I ask that you would fill me full of your Holy Spirit and allow me to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys.